Welcome to the Out of Limits of Truth Radio Show. OutofLimitsRadio.com. I'm your host, Ryan. This is The Death Show. This is part 10 and our third consecutive focus on near-death experiences. We are bringing Dr. Jeffrey Long back for a second interview, so let us begin tonight's show. Welcome back to the program. It's Dr. Jeffrey Long. He is a New York Times best-selling author. He is also the founder of the Near-Death Experience Research Foundation, which is the largest of its kind anywhere in the, where in the world. You can go learn more about Dr. Long by going to his website at nderf.org. You have to read some of these stories. They're absolutely amazing. Dr. Long, it is a great honor to once again have you with us. Oh, it's a real pleasure to be here. We've got lots to talk about. Yes. So in the course of the last couple of years, what would you say have been some of the more recent near-death experiences that um, you've recorded that have really kind of opened up your eyes and kind of sh- uh, surprised you? You know, I think now that we're over 4,000 near-death experiences that I've investigated, I think among the most startling things that I'm seeing is how remarkably consistent they are. Even after all these times and all these near-death experiences, that very consistent pattern uh, I see over and over along with other near-death experience researchers. I, Ryan, there's a basic scientific principle that what is real is consistently observed, and I guess it's that consistency that I'm seeing in so many near-death experiences that drives home that point over and over just how real they really are. I mean, dreams, hallucinations, any other altered consciousness in the world would have uh, the elements of the experience skipping skipping around. They're very different between different people, but you just don't see that with near-death experiences. And I've heard this idea that the brain cannot tell the difference between what is imaginary and what is real, but I'm wondering what is the difference between what the brain is perceiving and what is real and authentic in terms of what people perceive when they're dead. What is that form of consciousness? Is that consciousness outside the brain? or is I just don't understand the, the difference between the realism there, that type of real, and the real that we perceive based on the senses. Sense yeah, C- certainly. Oh, yeah, it, it's like uh, the, the Barnum and Bailey's say you can fool some of the people some of the time, but not all the people all the time. And with near-death experiences, you know, certainly any – there's a lot of altered uh, conscious experiences where people may perceive they're real during the event. But almost invariably for people that are, are normal and healthy, when they have finished that – experience of altered consciousness, be it a dream or hallucination, generally, certainly not always, but generally people can say, hey, that was different, that was a hallucination, that wasn't real. That's the key distinction, that it wasn't real. Contrast that with my survey question I ask those that had near-death experiences about what they think about the reality of their experience at the current time. Over 95% responding to that survey question that had a near-death experience themselves said that they believe their experience was definitely real. You just don't see that, Ryan, with any other altered consciousness experiences on the planet. Dr. Long, when you, uh, these your case studies, do you, have you ever found any type of consistent message or way that people who are dead, how they're trying to communicate with people who are alive? Is there any methodology or established protocol that is set up? when you are dead that you are only allowed to communicate in a certain way or is there, and is there anything that people who are alive can do to make a more discernible and distinctive contact with people who are no longer with us in the physical dimension yeah that's a good question there are very large numbers of near-death experiences where at that initial moment in their near-death experience their consciousness is separated from the body um, they may attempt to communicate you know, quote, verbally, unquote, uh, with those beings around them. This is a common scenario is, say, the operating room. There's lots of other people around. A uh, sudden life-threatening event, uh, heart stops, and the consciousness separates from the body. It's a classic near-death experience. They may try uh, yelling. They may try grabbing other people in the room. They may try a variety of ways to get their attention. When they try that, uh, almost invariably, they cannot be heard. They're presence in an out-of-body state cannot be, uh, is not aware of by anybody else in the room. If they try to touch someone, their uh, arms or appendages, if you will, will go right through the person in the physical world they're trying to contact. So at least from even that very early on uh, situation that we have a near-death experience, there does not seem to be a consistent way that that kind of communication can happen, even that 
early in the near death experience. Okay. And there's Yeah, I wish I wish I wish I had better news. I wish I could say, Hey, here's a recipe or a secret <laughs> and you know, we might be I, I believe me, I, I would have uh, tried that enormously, but they're just you know, it seems like shoot Ryan, dead is dead and if yeah. you can't you can't you you can't it's just unfortunately um, and I've even studied after death communication on a separate website, and there's just uh, unfortunately, after th- studying thousands of cases report, there's just no uh, magic or consistent thing you can do occasionally that you can communicate with the deceased that so called after death communication absolutely can happen, but it doesn't seem that you can induce it and it's it's not anything that we can control in our earthly life unfortunately and Dr. Long, do you have any cases where people are aware that they have had other experiences not through the human eyes. A lot of people, at least a lot of cases that I've read about near-death experiences, is that they talk about their life in the human form. And we've had a couple of rare instances where people have died and say, well, you know, I was also another being from another uh, dimension or another being from another planet. And I'm wondering if that is something that you are seeing more of or if you've seen a, a little bit about it where people are reportedly having, you know, recalling past life and past existences in other forms besides humans. Yeah, absolutely, Ryan. It's actually common when people have a near-death experience and they're in this unearthly or heavenly realm, which sounds so alien to us. Time doesn't exist. Colors are vastly more beautiful than anything they've known on Earth. Uh, Music unearthly in its beauty. I mean, to us, this is by definition unearthly, and yet it's common for people that are experiencing that to have a strong sense that this is their real home and that their earthly life was not their real home. So the concept of what's called pre-mortal existence or existence prior to our earthly life is very common in near-death experiences. And I, I think if you believe that we are truly eternal beings, then it's easy to conceptualize, to understand that our eternal existence didn't start at some particular point in time, a conception that we've really existed all through time and place. So we see a lot of that. The other part of your question it gets into issues of reincarnation, in other words, remembrance of past lives. I've actually done some investigation on that with the uh, near-death experiences we have. Now, those detailed discussions of remembrance of past lives, and this often happens during their life review, during the near-death experience, that they become aware of lives prior to their earthly existence. They're quite unusual, but again, by the time you have over 4,000 near-death experiences, I've got a pretty large series. Um, And certainly these descriptions of, if you will, uh, very long ago lives, uh, decades to centuries, are absolutely fascinating. Uh, they, They strike me as authentic in the sense that you didn't have someone coming back saying they were Cleopatra or something. The prior lives they describe are very mundane and and often what we would consider very boring and yet described in exquisite detail and from the investigations I've done consistent with the era that they're talking about uh, and and entirely possible. And we have uh, even more rarely, and again we're getting down to just a few cases where people have a sense that their prior lives involved an existence on other planets, other worlds outside of this Earth. And unfortunately, I don't have a lot of of vivid, detailed, prolonged descriptions of such a realm of existence, just people alluding to it. Dr. Jeffrey Long, New York Times best-selling author. He's also the founder of Near-Death Experience Research Foundation. I want to thank you so much for being with us today. To learn more about Dr. Long, please go to his website at nderf. Dot org. Thank you so much, Dr. Long. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Joining us now is Dr. Tony Sicoria. He had a near-death experience when he was struck by lightning. Tony, can you please explain to us exactly what happened and what you saw after you died? Sure. Um, I was at a family reunion in 1994, August, and we were at a place called Sleepy Hollow Lake, which is below Albany, New York. And we were at a pavilion, and there were 20-something people there. And everyone was up on the the first floor of it, and I was outside running the barbecue. And and in the morning, it seemed like it was a, a beautiful day. And then as the morning progressed, it got cloudy and I wasn't paying attention. And it had started sprinkling a little bit. And 
I decided that I, I wanted to go give my mother a call who was not at the party and just to check on her and I walked around the to the front of the pavilion and there was a payphone there attached to the wall and I tried to call my mom and I let the phone ring about eight times and she never picked up and as I took the phone away from my ear and and was taking it to hang it back up there was a loud crack and a huge flash of light came flying out of the phone and hit me in the face and it threw me back like a rag doll and and right at that moment that I was thrown back it became very strange because all of a sudden I felt myself move forward and I and I was very aware that I saw the lightning come out of the phone I I knew I got hit and I knew I had been thrown backwards but now I was confused because now I'm I'm standing there and and I had felt myself move forward and I didn't understand it and I, as I stood there, I was looking at the phone dangling and, and nothing made sense. And right at that moment, I heard my mother-in-law, who was at the top of the stairs and I was at the bottom, and I heard her screaming. And I felt like a deer in the headlights. I, I'm standing there at the bottom of the stairs, and she's running right at, toward me. But as she got down near the bottom of the stairs, it was obvious she wasn't looking at me. She was looking off to her left, and she went whizzing by me like I didn't even exist. And I turned to see where she was going, and I saw myself on the ground. And I had this sudden realization that holy crap, I, I'm dead. And as I, I stood there watching, I, I could hear everyone. I could see what was happening, but nobody could see or hear me. There was a lady who was waiting to use the phone, and it turned out that she was a nurse, and she got down. And I watched her start to get down and she was going to do CPR and and despite the fact that I couldn't get anybody's attention I I thought okay well you know the the first big realization that came to me at that moment was that I I'm standing here and I'm thinking like I normally would think there was no loss of of anything that had happened I was very aware of every single second of time of of what had happened from the time that I got hit and and as I stood there I, I realized that this whoever was on the ground was just an empty shell and so when this and happened, I was are you expecting at this I'm, point on the realizing your day you expecting to see some kind of angels or light coming out there I mean what did you have prior expectations to what it would be like when you died? Um, I didn't have any real prior thoughts about it, um, other than what I was taught when I was a kid. But at that moment in time, the only thing that I understood was that whoever I was, I always was. And whatever was on the ground was nothing. And so I turned to start to walk away. And as I walked away, I started to go toward the stairs, and the, the stairs, um, I, I, I started looking down at the stairs as I was walking up them, like I normally would, so I didn't trip and fall, just a matter of habit. And as I got to about the third stair, I, I noticed that my legs were dissolving. And and that was a bit earth shaking. And by the time I got to the top of the stairs, I had lost all form and was just a big ball of energy. 
and the, at the the first flight goes goes up a number of stairs and then veers to the left and I didn't I just went right through the wall I passed over my wife <clears throat> who was sitting on a couch in the the main room where everybody was was running around and she was painting children's faces and as as I went over the top of her and my kids you know I just had the realization that everybody's going to be fine not to worry and when I got through the building is when things really started to get interesting all of a sudden I felt like I had fallen into a a bluish white stream of pure positive energy and I don't know of any other way to describe it it was it was a lot like when I was a kid I would swim in in crystal clear um streams and when the light would pass through it it would have this sparkly appearance to it and it was a lot like that it it was it was earth shattering and the only th- sensations that i had were the sense of absolute peace and absolute love there was nothing else in it and as i looked around not only could i feel that energy i could see it and what i saw was there was an energy that ran through everything and for lack of a better word the i called that energy love whatever that force is it's what made up everything that we saw and as i was traveling in the stream i could i could feel the sensation of of acceleration i had speed i had direction i was going someplace I had no idea where um but it, i was reveling in in what i was what i was getting from this experience and my mind was racing and you know i had uh, a brief life um experience kind of like a, a collage of high points and low points that just flashed in front of me but i kept going on wherever this was Wait, taking me i was still going so these high points and low points was this considered the um what some people call it the end of life review where you perceive everything that happened to you from all different perspectives learn how your thoughts words actions affected other people or was it you just um, experiencing it from the first half perspective from your life i i think that it was a, an ab- abbreviated version of that from talking to lots of other people who've had similar experiences and having read a lot about it there seems to be two stages to that life review there's an an initial you know just brief high points low points and then as that journey progresses it becomes a very in-depth um uh, discussion and i never got the in-depth part of it i got the you know the blinding bluish white light the energy the the absolute love and absolute peace that were in this light and then as i was as i was going i i had this realization that this is the greatest thing that could ever happen to anyone and I right about get that i mean that's what most people are afraid of everyone's a, afraid of death in-laws and taxes and you tell me that they'll probably want to top of this is the greatest thing that I can ever want to happen it's amazing it it was dumbfounding absolutely amazing and right about the time i had that thought and suddenly i was back in my body and it was terrible it was painful i was angry and i remembered you know saying to god and to anybody who would listen please don't make me do this i don't want to go back and but i got the realization that this is not not the plan for me i had to go back and and so i'm now i'm back on the ground and 
and it was very painful where the where the bolt of lightning hit me in the face and where it came out on my left foot it just felt like somebody had stuck a hot poker in both of those places and i knew that i was still unconscious because i i couldn't move anything but i was back in the body and i remembered the the girl who was next to me had stopped doing cpr and and everybody was just kind of watching me to see what was going to happen and it seemed like minutes later i was able to open my eyes but it took about Five minutes before I could stand up and the ambulance and the police came and I refused to go to the hospital because my thinking at the time was, well, when you get struck by lightning, you're either alive or dead. There's not much in between. And so I thought, well, you know what, I'm just going to, I'll have my family take me home and, and I'll see my regular doctor and and I called them to tell them what was going on. And and so they, you know, the family took me home. I went to see him and uh, saw my neurologist as well. And, and everybody said the same thing. Well, you know, you're, you're very lucky. Usually with these things, you're either dead or alive. And so. Based on your experience, like, what has it done that you learned about? I mean, did you actually come in contact with, with God during your experience? And also, do you feel that, um, I guess what would be, in this to saying it was the greatest thing that ever happened to you, what would be like two or three of the major insights that you learned from your, from your experience? Well, I think the, the first thing I learned is that we have a spiritual body and we have an earth body. And I saw the earth body and it was just an empty shell. And whoever my spiritual body is, is always. I, I'm the same person from lifetime to lifetime and from the from the beginning to the end i i am who i am and i'm talking about previous lifetimes from the beginning of of when my spirit existed i i am who i have always been and somewhere i'm sure that i have those memories locked away but I don't have access to them, um, but that's okay too. And the 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 next big realization that I I had was that the feeling of absolute peace and absolute love, and it, I really felt that what I saw and felt at that time was God. Whatever God is this was the manifestation of it that was something I could understand. And so, and, and the other thing, the other big realization was that death is not something to be feared. This was, this was a tremendous experience and it gave me great uh, hope and feeling that, when when I pass, I I will go back to that place again, and I will get to re-experience the absolute euphoria and bliss of of having been there. Dr. Scoria, I'm curious about your personality not changing. I mean, during a person's physical life incarnation, they experience some events. Some events would be considered life-changing events, trauma, traumas, or even positive things that could you know, permanently changed their personality. So I'm wondering how your personality was the same despite having gone, gone through so many different life incarnations. Did you get a sense that your lifetimes on Earth were very peaceful, that you they weren't subject to change, or do you think that fundamentally speaking, everyone has the same components of their personality that will not change regardless what happens in no matter what lifetime you take on? Yeah, I, I my takeaway from that was that the personality that I have and the way that I I think are spiritual qualities. This this is the essence of who I am. How that is influenced by individual lifetimes is is gonna vary. I mean you take 
you take a certain genetic makeup and you expose it to different life circumstances, the end result may be different. Um, but the basic spiritual person that I am, I, I think, is always the same. Got it. Dr. Tony Sequoia, I want to thank you so much for being with us today and sharing your near-death experience. It's very much appreciated, sir. You're very welcome. Joining us now is Dr. S- Actually, you know what? I'm sorry. Dr. Sinatra. Do I see your name, Stephen or Stefan? Oh, Stephen's good. Okay. Stephen Sinatra. Three, two, one. Joining us now is Dr. Stephen Sinatra and Mr. Tommy Rosa. Tommy Rosa had a near-death experience in his 40s. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for being with us. It's Thank good to be here, me. Ryan. Yeah. Good. Mr. Rosa, can you please explain or talk about your near-death experience? What happened to you? And what was some of the first things that occurred when you you died that you were you were experiencing? One evening, I was going to a local store to get a loaf of bread, and I had to cross the street to get there. And that night, I got hit by a car going 40 miles an hour, and knocked me 28 feet, and I was pronounced dead on the spot. And at that point, I went through this tunnel of white light, through this tunnel going like face first. I'm watching all this beautiful white light with pink and blues going fa- faster than you can think and not having any fear at all, just total peace and calmness was put over me. And I really didn't know anything would happen to me. I don't remember getting hit by the car at all. And that was all filled into me by later on. And they had to shock me back to life because I had heart failure. And I was in a coma for a couple of weeks too after that. But during that time, I was in heaven, and I met a spiritual teacher. And the spiritual and teacher gave me these eight revelations on how to heal the body. Okay, what was? Do you mind if can you share what those eight revelations are? Sure. Well, one of them is that each and every one of us are all connected. Each of us, we're connected to God, ourselves, and to others. It's just an illusion that we're not connected. And a good example is when something bad happens, what happens? Everyone gets together and starts to help each other. Like uh, when the World Trade Center came down, everyone went together to pray and to help heal the situation. And in the book, we write about the the, the miners in Brazil when they got trapped. Chile. So we had that in the book, too, that everyone bands together and becomes one which is so important that we don't really realize how important as group consciousness is. It helps us heal and also helps us be connected to each other. Okay. So, I just want to pause for one second. The book is called Heaven Revelations from Heaven and Earth, and we're going to post a link on it to our site. It was written by you both. So what were some of the other revelations that they told you? Uh, the, the next one is that... We have to understand that this faith has to prevail over fear. When you do that, then your whole life just starts to change differently for you. Because where there's fear, there is no faith. And where there's no faith, there is fear and you aren't connected to God and yourself. So I call that, that's called the revelation is... um, so when they're saying fear, you said that uh, previously that we're all connected. So if you have fear, does that what enhance the power of the illusion of separation, which would minimize your chances of feeling connected, of feeling a part of the infinite source of life, which was some could call God? That's so correct. Because when you don't feel connected to God or feel fear that you can't be connected to him, you're going to lose your faith. Okay. And the next one we had was the revelation of vital force. And this one was really intriguing to me because I knew nothing about what a mitochondria cell was when I was in heaven. I was a plumber. And Dr. Sinatra really asked a lot of questions about this one because he was working on this his whole life, talking about the vital force of the body with the mitochondria cells. And that was really interesting because I learned something that he was doing here on Earth. And that was one of the big reasons why 
we had to work together because he was doing it on earth and I learned it in heaven. Wow. So that was really powerful. And the other one was the revelation grounding that God told me that he gives the people ways to heal and they don't use it. And I said, what, what are some it? of those ways? Excuse me? What are some of the ways? Just going out and touching a tree, hugging a tree, walking barefoot in the park, laying down on the ground or by the beach. What happens is the earth has a certain energy and it helps detoxify the body and bring energy back to you, which is really amazing because it doesn't cost you a thing to do it. It's just an effort to get to the beach or hug a tree or take your shoes off and relax. That's great. Isn't it? Jeez, wait till Big Pharma hears this. This is fantastic. <laughs> the next one we had is the body <laughs> temple. Now, the body temple is our body's ability to take care of it, to nurture it, to love it, to take care of it. And when you have that going on for yourself, the body temple, you start to vibrate differently. Now, everything on the planet has a frequency and a vibration. And what we want to do is we want the vibration to be high. The higher your vibration, the healthier your body's going to be. The more your immune system works better, too. So with all these revelations going together like this, we're making ourselves to be much more powerful people in our divinity. And the divinity is what's so important because... We have a divine self that's in heaven and a physical self that's here. And the physical self gets the information from the divine self through our intuition. So if we have a lower vibration here, we're going to miss out on our intuition abilities to see what's going on. So, well, I just want to pause just one second. Aren't there some people who are dark that can utilize you know, ESP or they can utilize telekinesis, uh, you know, for wicked ways or, or harming others. Is that necessary? Are those um, extra sensory perceptions only limited to, to celestial? Well, that's true because we don't live in a full light world. We live in a dark and light world. That's why we mm-hmm. come here. We come here to experience the light and the dark so we can choose which way we want to go. That's our experiences here. Okay. So, I mean, there's good and bad in everything, right? So, why not so, in this? Now, we were talking to God. Was there anything you could describe about it? Was there a visual description you can offer? Oh, yeah. In, in the book, it's the greatest moment. When I asked my teacher who he was, which I don't want to ruin the secret because it's really beautiful, and I asked him to show me what God looks like, and he lifts up his hand, and he shows me this beautiful variation of different colors of light, blue, green, orange, and it was rapidly turning around, spinning. And I start to fall to my knees in tears because the love coming off is so immense that my soul couldn't even take it with so much love. And I really knew that's the greatest moment we have in the book also. And that was Which so peaceful. And then after that, God? I was back into my body. Okay. Now, at that moment, when you were experiencing that, did you... Did you have an overwhelming feeling that God was a being that was separate, that was separate and greater than you, that was outside of you, or did you feel that your energy resonance was one with God and that God was all collective consciousness merely reflecting back to you in a much condensed form? That is a perfect description because when you're in heaven like that and you felt that energy, you are part of God's love, just like we are here. We just okay. don't feel it enough because we're in the darkened world, but it is there. We are connected to the source of God's love. And the unconditional love is what heals our bodies, which is so important. Okay, that's, that's, that's pretty amazing. And, you know, Dr. Snatcher, I want to come to you in about a minute, but I do want to ask uh, Tommy a, just a couple more questions. When you are in this place and you are experiencing heaven, are you gaining any perception or any insight into reincarnation? Does it exist? Does it occur? Did you see anything about any previous life incarnations that you had? And also, at the same time, I would like to ask, is heaven one definitive place where all souls, souls eventually make? Or is the heaven that you were in a one of many types of heavens that are out there? Well, there is reincarnation. And what it does is that we come here to experience Earth, 
and we have different ways to come back, different religions, different cultures, because we want to learn more about humanity and about our divine self. So we, we pick and choose well, who our parents going to be, what nationality going to be, what religion going to be, so we can all feel this connection to everyone. This is what makes it so beautiful is that we've been everything. Everyone's been everything, <laughs> which so, I don't realize that. And, and that's why people shouldn't be uh, racist or controlled about other people's lives and being judgmental because each and every one of us, we're all the same. We're all the same. Now, have we also been animals as well? We've heard in another interview that animals almost apparently have a higher evolution. So I wanted to know if human humanity is on a lower level of, of evolution and then once you become more pure, you become an animal or you become even part of nature because it seems that nature and animals have a more purity or more higher vibration. They do. And also the the best incarnation is a tree. <laughs> really? Because a tree lasts the longest and it helps purify the world with oxygen and all the trees, and when you see groups of trees together, what makes them powerful is that the root system, they all connect little pieces of each other underneath. And that's what makes them as a whole group of consciousness, which is pretty amazing. Yeah, I think it would be pretty amazing because, you know, if you're a tree, then you have a, you're, you're a woody every day. And now the redwoods were planted 2,000 years ago. Do you think that some of those trees could actually be people, previously people, that just like, you know, coming back as a tree? Well, it, it, I wouldn't call them people. I would call them souls. Souls, okay. Excellent. Well, Dr. Sinatra, you met with Tommy. Tommy comes out of a near-death experience. He sits down and talks to you. How did this relationship come about, and were you completely shocked about his near-death experience, and how did it impact you? Well, the first – well, the, the the latter half, how it impacted me, it was the greatest uh, connection I ever made in my life. I am so blessed that uh, Tommy was placed in my path, and I believe that my entire life after meeting Tommy was preordained. In other words, we think events happen in our lifetime by chance, but they really don't. I mean, uh, when I look at all the dots I connected in my life, you know, which college I went to, how I got into college, how I got into medical school, you know, how I didn't get drafted in the Vietnam War, when I look at all this stuff, I, I absolutely know it was all, you know, preordained. So um, I, I feel that for me it was a wonderful, or the greatest experience for me to meet Tommy. Now, when I met Tommy, I was privy to a lot of life and death. I mean, I'm an invasive cardiologist. I've been in uh, emergency rooms, delivery rooms, ORs, ICUs, CCUs. I've put in emergency pacemakers, done emergency cardiac catheterizations. I mean, I've done it all. And uh, I've been at the bedside of hundreds of dying people. Uh, now, about maybe 20 to 25 of my patients had near-death experiences. And when I became a psychotherapist, uh, some of the most important parts of the doctor-patient relationship, you know when a patient comes in your office, you spend 20 minutes or a half hour, sometimes longer. You know, back in the day, we spend longer time than they do today. Uh, I'd have my hand on the doorknob. My patient was great. I said, I'll, I'll see you in three months. You're doing great. And then they would say, Doc, there's one more thing. And that one more thing was really the, the, the most important part of the interview. But they had, you know, they had sort of ill feelings about sharing it because they didn't want to think that, that I would think they were crazy. And these patients would come out with, you know, Doc, when, I, when you were resuscitating me, <clears throat> I, saw you, I saw you. I was on the ceiling watching for you. I rooted for you. Uh, other patients told me that they went in the white light like Tommy or the tunnel of light. Other people tell me they were in heaven and they, and, and they saw, you know, their loved ones and stuff like that. So I was privy to this. So when I met Tommy, I was ready for Tommy's incredible experience, but I never met a near-death experience like Tommy because Tommy came back with a, he was downloaded with years of information, uh, years of information about health and healing and about love and, and all that great stuff and vibration. And um, when I met him at a conference, I had a hip replacement, and I had just given a lecture on grounding, and uh, I had a pain in my hip, probably due to uh, an infection because I had some cancer on my face and biopsies. I forgot to tell the plastic surgeon I had a steel, you know, hip, you know, recent reconstruction of the hip joint. I didn't take antibiotics, and I, I had, you know, an acute inflammation or an infection in my hip, 
And Tommy walks over to me, and he says, I enjoyed your lecture. And he says, by the way, you have an infection in your hip. And I said, how could you possibly know that? And he told me, spirit told me. And I said, oh, spirit told you? I said, okay, you and I got to talk. <laughs> so ever since that time, we, we've had this incredible relationship. And then after he was able to trust me, he told me about how he was, you know, you know killed in the, in the car and, and how he went to heaven and back, this round trip, and how he suffered with heart problems for years. And I'll tell you, the way God works is, this is amazing. When Tommy was run over, he had a cardiac contusion. Uh, he needed a pacemaker, a defibrillator. He had what we call cardiomyopathy. He saw several cardiologists and doctors, and they all told him he needed a heart transplant. And then when I was placed in his path, um, I put him on my metabolic cardiology program. He learned it in heaven. It was called Vital Force, where you drive ATP in a preferential direction with coenzyme Q10 and, and uh, uh, carnitine and ribose and magnesium. And then, you know, I was able to really support Tommy's heart. I got him back on his feet. I readjusted his drugs. You know, I did, it, I did an echo in my office myself with the technician. I'm looking at it. And so I was sent to Tommy to sort of, quote, help heal his heart. And Tommy was sent to me because of two things. Tommy mentioned a couple of them already. He sort of validated my life's work. Uh, even when I came out with Coenzyme Q10 30 years ago with my research, when I was chief of cardiology, doctors were walking out of the room because even, even though I was talking about great stuff, because they couldn't believe it. In other words, you know, doctors didn't believe it. If it wasn't a pharmaceutical drug, it didn't work. You know, how, how could a vitamin that we get from fish or sardines, you know, heal the heart? The other thing Tommy did for me is, you know, being at the bedside of hundreds of people who experienced death and dying, some survived. I, I brought back some. I lost some. But I had a fear of my own death because uh, I, I, I've been at some pretty – you know, tough situations. And uh, after meeting Tommy, I'll tell you, Ryan, there's no yeah. doubt in my mind, I mean, we're all going to a better place. You know, we live in a cylinder. We live in his body. Uh, but when the body, you know, starts to cease, when the body dies, our consciousness lives on forever. And that's what I learned from Tommy. And, uh, you know, so in the good. book, we, we talk about the Tibetan Book of the Dead. It was written in the 8th century. And even the author states that the greatest moment of our physical existence here on earth is the moment we die and then he talks wow. about you know the, the the tunnel of light and then the books about the bardos and how you prepare for your death <laughs> in, in this lifetime while you're alive it's, it's, it's a really wow. exciting book this book is absolutely fascinating it's called heaven heaven revelations from no, health heaven revelations to earth. health revelations health from revelations heaven. from heaven and earth and Ryan, you, you you got the metaphor. Tommy represents the divine. I re represent, you know, the the science, the earth, the earthly stuff. But the divine is 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 you know way above what 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 I do. But uh, I, uh, Tommy and I validate each other, which is which is really. Oh, I think it's great. I think you guys should have your own uh, a sitcom. And uh, Tommy, I've I've got one final uh, question for you, sir. Okay. And that is this, you know. Every time something bad happens, uh, whether it be death or whether it be, uh, you know, you stub your toe, it's always somebody always says, God has a plan. God has a plan. When you were seeing God, did you ask God for the plan? Did he lay out the plan? And did you see anything in that plan that it was, was it a good plan or did it uh, have any things that needed some improvement upon it? Well, I never learned anything from him about my life. I thought I was going to stay in heaven forever after I was there. And then after I found out what God looked like, I was sent back through the tunnel of light backwards, and I ended up in the hospital bed coming around from being in a coma. A nurse Jeez. telling me that I was ran over by a car, and I said, what? To myself? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a, it's pretty shocking. Listen, I want to thank you both very much, Mr. Tommy Rosa and Dr. Stephen Sinatra. I want to thank you both. Where can we learn more about you? It's healthrevelationsbook.com. Thank you both. God bless. All right, thank you. God bless. Joining us now is Miss Erica McKenzie. Miss McKenzie had a near-death experience when she was 31 years old. She's also written a book about a near-death experience called Dying to Fit In. Miss McKenzie, can you please tell us about your near-death experience? What happened? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me on your show. Um, you know, what you're doing with the near-death experience and bringing these spiritual experiences to light I think is so important. So thank you for your time. And having me. Um, so yeah, it's it's true. At 31 years old, I died. And um, what happened was I had been taking a class four narcotic. It was a diet pill concoction called Fen Fen. Not sure if you heard of that. Oh. Back then, 
Um, but it was actually under doctor prescription, and you were to take it for a total of three months maximum when you were seeing a physician. Do you know how long I took the drug? For three years? No, I took it for nine. Nine years. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> so there were just horrific side effects of the drug, and um, you know a lot of people ended up getting hurt and did die and not <laughs> weren't able to come back. Um, and so the biggest side effects from this drug were not being able to sleep or eat, Try doing that for nine years, a consistent pattern of, you know, not having those basic functions that we need to sustain life as humans. And what started happening, Ryan, was my um, heart started to not beat on a regular rhythm and basis. It was, like, really finding difficulty to beat, and not only that, my lungs. Um, it was harder and harder for my lungs to remember how to open and close. Just, like, something, it's a function we don't even think about. You know, it's so natural for us, but um, it was getting to be almost impossible for me to get my lungs to open and close so I could get a breath. And I just remember, you know, getting into these little habits, um, especially, you know, the, the few years right before I died. Um, it, it, was, it became so bad that I would have to, like, jump up and down just out of the blue. I'd be anywhere, grocery store, it didn't matter. And I could feel my heart starting to slow, and it wasn't going to be able to beat much longer. And my lungs all of a sudden, like, feeling like they were, like, sticking to each other and not being able to open. And I would have to jump up and down to remind myself to get air in my lungs. And, um, you know, that day that I died, that's exactly what happened. I went to take that last breath, and I'm jumping up and down, and this time it didn't work. I couldn't restart myself or whatever you want to call it. Oh, my God. So, yeah. so what ultimately happened? You, you, you died this time of heart failure. Yeah, so basically what ended up happening was um, I remember jumping up and down and trying to draw a breath and even get words out, and I couldn't. And I, I just remember thinking, I believe in God. That was the last thing, and I just let go in that moment. Um, and I just distinctly remember my soul, healing my soul, or my real self is what I call it now, um, separating from my physical body. And I, I, the next memory I have was I was at the top of the ceiling, and I was looking down. And I recognized my body. It was me. It was myself. You know, I'd been in it for 31 years. But this new, this new feeling that I had um, was the real me. And I wasn't confined. I, it was like I had no boundaries. It was like being in myself, that physical body was a box, almost being placed and, you know, confined. And not only that, you know, I was terrified of dying. I was so terrified of dying until this happened to me because I was convinced Number one, it was going to be extremely painful, and number two, I was going to be judged because that's how I was raised, you know, in organized religion. And so, wait, what religion? Go ahead. What what, what uh, organized what religion? Okay, so I was raised Lutheran. Okay. All right. So, uh, so you were afraid about being judged? Yes. So, you know, I was just since a child, we you know went to church on a very regular basis, and so I was very educated in that religious um, belief system, and while I see it now as a really important tool and I appreciate those things, I was terrified because I, I knew, you know, I was a sinner, and sinners were judged when they died by God, and I was convinced, you know, I was going to go to hell because I knew I had messed up so much, you know, that I was going to be judged. So, um, but it was it was just, it was crazy because when that happened and I'm I'm on the ceiling, before I let go and I'm looking at my body, you know, and I'm admiring it, knowing that's me, you know, it was a great ride, but this is really me. And I had no desire to go back into my old self. And, you know, I'm watching the paramedics are coming in and they're starting to do life sustaining things on my body. And I'm thinking, that's so nice that they're, you know, trying to help me, but they're really wasting time. I, I felt like there's something else they could go be helping someone else, which is it's just what I was thinking. It was like, I'm not going back in. And so, you know, as soon as I, let go. I just, I couldn't believe it. It was like, there was no pain. There was no pain that I experienced from that separation from my body at any, any part um, in this whole, you know, experience that I have this pain that I thought I would have. And, and, and it was actually the opposite. It was like the most incredible, exhilarating feeling of being alive and love. The kind of love that I felt that was filling up my body was um, love that I had not experienced on the level that I was experiencing at this time on the planet. I hadn't experienced it like that before. Okay. So you're feeling filled with love now. At what point do you apparently you 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 meet God at this point? 
Well, not quite yet. So basically I'm getting filled with love and I let go. And I find, found myself as soon as I let go, I was going through this tunnel and it was filled with the most incredible love and brilliant light. And the light should have technically been blinding, but it wasn't at all. It was just, it had a life of its own. It was amazing. And it was like this love I started feeling as I'm, I'm going at supersonic speed effortlessly up. Um, I knew exactly where I was going. I knew I was going home. And I remember feeling this love was familiar. It was so familiar. So not only was it something I hadn't experienced on earth, but how could it be familiar, right, if I hadn't experienced on earth? It was incredible. And if I would have just stayed in the tunnel, honestly, it would have been the most incredible thing in and of itself. But, you know, eventually I remember seeing like a clearing at the end of the tunnel and I finally get there. And what it was, was for me, it was like I was out in space, the whole cosmos area. And I remember just being delivered into the hands of God. And there was no doubt in my mind, um, you know, since I was a child, I had this relationship with God. And um, so then, you know, being reconnected with God at this moment, it was just the most incredible. Um, so what was hard the to most describe. Like? Uh, well, well, is there a visualization to describe? Is, is, it, is uh, God a man? Is God a woman? Yeah. Is, is there anything? Great question. Well, yeah. For me, um, what I what I understood was number one, um, the way God and I began to communicate was completely different than anything I had experienced. It was like this telepathic communication where I would think a thought, and as soon as I would think that thought, um, God would replace that thought with the answer of knowledge, just like volumes of it. I could hardly even contain it. And so God and I were standing together. And to answer your question, Ryan, God, for me, God was not a man. It wasn't a woman. God wasn't a sex. Being um, a gender was actually putting God in a box, if you will. Mm. Um, And so and God was so magnificent that I couldn't look directly upon God. Um, And at the same time, God was able to just almost like it was like he was hugging me, just envelop me. And fill me with all this love and all of these lessons. And so, you know, that's when the lessons began. And God and I stood together. <laughs> it's like the universe. And I'm looking out in front of me. And I can see galaxies and stars and everything. And I remember just having this incredible knowing that right behind our backs was heaven. And I wasn't allowed at that time to turn around. And I wanted to. But for whatever reason, you know, God wanted me to look forward. And um, that's when the first lesson began. You know, I had, as you know, two life reviews. Sure, yeah. Can you please describe those two life reviews? What were they? Why did you have two? Most people just talk about one. I know. Well, that's because Erica needed two to get a clue. That's the only thing I can tell you. So wait, they they gave you a first life review and you said, okay. It was the same life? I'm just joking, and I I apologize, but actually I found out that, um, thank goodness God does have a sense of humor, just so you know, because I should have been, like, totally drop-kicked several times. Um, Just takes me sometimes, you know, a little bit longer, I guess, um, to learn. I I had learning disabilities growing up, so God was so patient. But anyway, the first life review, you know, we're looking out at the stars and everything, and all of a sudden I'm noticing something, and the stars, they begin to, like, line up like a curtain, huge curtain. And then they begin to separate. And when they began to separate, I heard this um, whirring sound in my left ear, like a projector, a vintage projector, counting down, three, two, one. And the stars parted and revealed this huge white movie screen. <laughs> it said the life review of Eric McKenzie. And the very first image I remember seeing on there was me the day I was born. And this first life review was the day I was born up until, you know, 31 years when I died, all of these events that um, are considered like milestone events for humans, you know, things like um, one of the first memories was losing a tooth when I was little, um, winning the spelling bee, you know, playing sports and winning awards in school for that, um, graduating from high school, you know, going to college. It was like all these amazing experiences, granted, but there was this common theme and they were things that mankind uses to um, label, if you will, you know, success. And so I'm getting to the end of that day that I died 31 years. And then all of a sudden I had this like almost a panic attack because I realized, Oh my gosh, I haven't seen anything negative. And not only that, but God hasn't judged me. And how is that happening? (laughs) Because I've 
I knew I messed up so much in my life. You know, I was a sinner. And what did you think that you were messing up for? Of all the things that you thought you had messed up for, what were the things that you felt the most guilty Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Where, how much time do you have? Let's see. I mean, I, you know, I wasn't perfect. I made mistakes constantly. Okay. You know, it was one of those things that um, I guess, you know, all the things that I did starting in sixth grade middle school, you know, trying to overdose on pills and then having bulimia for 12 years and then, you know, substituting that dirty little secret for the diet pills. I was never overweight, by the way, Ryan, just so you know. Those are coping okay. mechanisms that I I drew upon, I used to try to um, control this thing that was happening to me. I, I, I didn't fit in, no matter what okay. I did. Yeah. I just want to pause for just one second. As you're doing the life review and you're seeing how you're living this life and you feel guilty because you have done these things, uh, mm -hmm. there's, have you, did you ever see during the life review that you had harmed someone and that you, you had emotionally um, inflicted pain with joy right. upon someone or right. you physically harmed anyone? Okay, well, first, no, I wasn't seeing anything negative, which I, you know, I've pondered on that for years because, like I said, Logically, I'm the first person to tell you I am not perfect at all. I have made so many mistakes. I know I've, you know, hurt people's feelings and things over the years, and and why I didn't see that, I, I don't know. But okay. um, I will tell you, you know, by the time we get to the end of that review, and I'm having those feelings like, oh my gosh, I haven't been judged yet. I'm going to be judged. Um, God replaced that feeling with the most incredible love that you can imagine almost so much that I didn't even know where to put it or receive any more of it. I thought it was going to burst. But so then what ended up happening was um, all of a sudden in front of me appeared eyeglasses. Like, you know, you wear for vision here, mm -hmm. people, right? Okay. So these eyeglasses were the size of a small vehicle and I had never worn glasses up until this point, 31 years. My eyes were, you know, I had perfect vision. But all of a sudden, there's these huge eyeglasses, and God told me to put them on. And I'm thinking, it's impossible. I mean, how am I going to do that? And as soon as I had that thought, I felt my arms, you know, drawing the glasses near. I grabbed them and it pulled them onto my face. And, of course, you know, they fit perfect. And then God said, now look. And that's when my second life review began. And, um, you know, to answer your question, this life review, I'm looking now um, – with God's glasses on. So I see in the second life review, not at all what I saw the first time. So the first time, what it was that I saw was all the things that were important to mankind. But the second life review with God's glasses were all the things that were important to God. And they were totally opposite. And so this is what I saw again, movie screen. And, you know, starting that day that I was born and I'm noticing things like, you know, I didn't even remember that I had done, right? Because they weren't significant accomplishments, but they were things like um, when I was five, I was in the rest home and I was brushing this little old lady's hair and I was singing, Jesus loves me, you know, and she felt so loved and, you know, helping um, animals or kids that were bullied or, you know, homeless person giving them money when I didn't have money to give. So the common theme through this whole second life review, you know, until that 31 years I died was thoughts actions, words of love. Love was the theme and kindness, you know, and those were the only things, those are the only things that were important to God. And I remember, you know, God telling me this and, and knowing how important it was for me to never forget this. And again, so, go ahead. I'm sorry, can you please explain more <laughs> examples of what God was happy with? What God was happy with in the review? Yes. What other oh, things? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, for sure. It was, um, okay, so for example, you know, I, I dealt with a lot of bullying issues growing up. And um, so there was times, you know, over and over, I didn't feel like I was getting anywhere because I'd be sticking up for the kids that were getting bullied. And I got bullied, too. And I, I was exhausted by it because I felt like I wasn't making progress. You know, I was trying to help people to see, let's get along. I don't understand. You know, why are we tearing each other down? And, and you know, God was really showing me how um, when I was sticking up for those kids, you know, and I kept trying and trying. Those are the things that were important because it came from my heart. And love was involved to have that action. You know, even though I didn't feel like I was making a difference, I was. So, um, and, you know, people would ignore, like, an elderly person maybe that, you know, needed help or, or needed just to be listened to, you know, feel loved. And just taking those few moments of even just having a thought of love and care for another human being or um, animals, you know, our planet, 
was so powerful. It was, it was more powerful than any kind of accomplishment, you know, as far as like an accolade, um, a degree, whatever it is, you know, that we deem important here. Those can't even hold a candle to just a thought of sincere love, you know, from your heart. And yeah, it was just, it was like, it was so powerful for me because I had given so much love and care for people, you know, my whole life that, um, I didn't realize, you know, I was paying attention to what was important to mankind. I kept trying to fit in. I kept trying to change myself so that I would fit in and then people would be nice to me. You know, then people would like me, but I didn't see that all along, you know, God made me the way I was supposed to be. And here I was changing that. And, and so okay. I couldn't, yeah. So that's why. All right. And when you got a chance to review your life from the moment you were a baby, what I want to know is did you happen to come upon an event where you had a trauma that was a seed that grew into um you know your your disorder that you you developed that you were that you were taking all these pills was there something that happened that was something traumatic you experienced when you were a kid that was the root cause of what you were doing or did you actually have a sense that the pain and anxiety you were experiencing in this life incarnation was something that was carried over from a previous existence that needed to be resolved in this life incarnation? Right. Oh, I think that those are excellent questions. And um, the best way I can answer them for you is, you know, just to tell you that my first memory at five years old was my ability to be able to see, feel, and hear spirit. And um, so I didn't think of it as a gift at the time. I kind of thought of it as a curse eventually. But um, And so, you know, I, I had that clear understanding from an experience, and I write about it in the book, um, you know, that day in kindergarten, I had a horrific lesson happen to me. And um, that was the very what first happened? time. Well, I was left-handed. And back then, where I grew up, um, that wasn't okay, but I didn't know that. I didn't even know the difference, honestly, at five between left and right hand, other than I could do a lot of things with my left hand quite well. And my, um, we had a lesson on the alphabet, penmanship writing, and um, the teacher, I thought I was getting a sticker for my good work, and she asked me to hold out my hands, and she began to slap my hands with a wooden ruler in front of my whole class and told me that um, you don't write with your left hand. You write with your right hand. So that, that was a very leave it up. Leave it up to the public education system. I don't want to yeah. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. It was like almost surreal. Like, is this happening? It was like a movie, watching a movie, but you're in it, unfortunately. Yeah, so that was, I'll never forget it, but that was the very first moment that I heard God's voice, that connection that I had with God. And so I knew from five years old, and then having this gift of, you know, getting downloads for people and helping them, knowing information I technically shouldn't know, and learning to work with it, you know, as a child. Um, I knew how we were supposed to be. I knew that we were supposed to all get along. I didn't know what it was at the time, but I, I knew it was this big thing. We were supposed to empower each other, you know, love each other, and who cares about our differences? And actually, they were important. And I learned that when he told me, you know what? No, Erica, I made your left hand. I love you, you know, that day in kindergarten. And I made your right hand, and I loved it too. And then I remember him telling me to look at my classmates, and they're, you know, have a look of relief, but everybody's got their pencil in their right hand. I was the only left-handed one. And he's like, I made the right hands and I love them too. And he, it was so clear at five that we're different because we're supposed to be It's part of our blueprint. And it's so important to make sure that you celebrate your, you know, your uniqueness because when you live as your unique self and you love your unique self, you unlock your blueprint. And that's when you can access your gifts. And that's sure. when you can, you know, use them to um, complete your mission here on your earthly journey. You know, when we come back to when you're talking with God, I mean, there's some more fascinating accounts of your experience when you're talking with God. And mm -hmm. did you, when you're speaking with God, did you ha come across any questions that would talk about the existence of why we're here on Earth and also... Um, if Earth was heading towards a more celestial place of, or, mm -hmm. or if Earth was becoming a more tyrannical place? Well, God made it very clear to me that this is Earth school and we're here to learn. <clears throat> That's our purpose. We are here to learn. So if you're living and breathing, you are here to learn. And learning comes with mistakes and you know imperfections and all of those things. And we can actually, when we embrace those things, rather than trying to 
you know, like do the things that I did before I had this experience with those imperfections. Those imperfections and mistakes, they look different for everyone, but they can be our greatest strengths and our greatest lessons and help us to complete our mission. So, yeah, our purpose here is to learn. Um, I mean, so much happened. I was, I had so many lessons. I was there for the best way I can figure it out is each so I had two life reviews, and both life reviews I feel like were equivalent to 31 years of human lifetime. So that was time two, times two. And then um, after that, I had a lesson of the rippling effect, and then I had a lesson of um, the gifts. Rippling like, effect. What's the rippling effect? Is that when what every word, thought, deed uh, somehow affects someone else? Yes. Mm-hmm. In a nutshell, yeah. I mean, there was a lot to it. There was a lot of components to each lesson that I learned. Hence why I, I felt compelled to write the book because I, you know, I'm not a writer, and, but it was one of those things. There was just so many messages that I needed to make sure that I, you know, shared um, in hopes to help other people. And so, yeah, it was definitely that. And, you know, then we had this whole lesson of the rippling effect, and I really understood that. Um, and that was, you asked me a question earlier about what God looked like. Yeah. Okay. So the only time to this whole experience that, for me, um, God took on any kind of a manifested in any form was during the rippling effect lesson. And what it was, was um, I remember God telling me to look to my right out in front of me. So I'm looking to my right, and all of a sudden, his hand appeared like a human hand. And I remember looking at his fingertips. And then I remember looking up all the way to his shoulder. So it was just his fingertips all the way to his shoulder, his arm. And I remember it was like the size of a semi-truck is the best way to explain how big it was. And um, so I remember looking at it thinking, oh, my gosh, that's God's arm. And then as soon as I'm having that thought, I watched and God raised his arm up. It was so powerful. So his fingertip was now touching like way beyond the stars in the sky above me. And I'm looking up and I can't even see his finger. It kept on going farther than I could see. And he put his palm flat. And then in his palm of his hand appeared a huge boulder, a rock. Um, and that was the size of like a van, you know, car van. Mm-hmm. And um, and I'm looking at this rock and I'm thinking, oh, my God, that's like the biggest rock I've ever seen. And all of a sudden as I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, that's a huge rock, um, this light just emanates from all over, radiates everywhere from this rock. I mean, it's so blinding. I, can't, I can barely even look. And as I'm looking at this light that's coming from the rock, God says, you're the rock. And I'm thinking, I'm the rock. And he says, you're the light. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I'm the light. And he says, the light is of me and I'm with you. And then that's when he let loose the rock and we watched it fall for what seemed like, you know, forever. And as it's falling and God and I are watching the rock, um, appeared in front of me, the largest body of water, greater than the largest ocean. I mean, I couldn't even see the borders outstretched my vision everywhere. And we're watching this water and I see the rock. And then all of a sudden the rock, it plunges into the water, just a huge, you know, impact. And it makes one single ripple, just one. And we watched together as this ripple, it grew and it grew and it grew. And I couldn't even see the borders of the ripple anymore. And God says, like the ripple affects the water, so too does man's words and actions affect mankind. And he said, you, he told Erica, me, you are the ripple. And mankind is the water. And so I understood in that very moment that it wasn't about me, only, oh, Erica, you know, this is about, this is a lesson that applied to each and every one of us, you know, and I understood that each and every one of us, we were the rock, right? And so with the gift of life, hand in hand comes free will. And here's the deal. So life is the rock and free will is you choose to put your light on while you're here or not, but you're going to make an impact. You're going to make a ripple. You don't get that choice. Just like I saw the rock drop in the water. But when you make that ripple, the choice is up to you. If you do it with your light on or off, and when you have it on, that's the connection and love is the connection joins us all. So anyway, that was that lesson. <laughs> so it was just... Okay. So at this point, you know what? I'm curious to know if when you're with God, did you feel that God was outside of you, that God was a separate uh, entity from you, that God was your creator and that he was a, like a father, a maternal-like figure? Right. That's a great question. Oh, my gosh. Okay, for me, there's absolutely no doubt in my whole being here that God 
was completely not me. I was not God. I was definitely not even close to being the cheer level of God. It was, yeah, it was definitely like, um, you know, higher than a father figure, my creator. I mean, it was very, it was very apparent to me that this was the one that created me. And that was the only reason why I had life, you know, and, but I, yeah, I, I knew that I was not even at all, like to even say God was of me would be putting him in a box. That's how I felt. So I, well, I, I'm just saying I that yeah. because they say that the, um, I've heard this thing saying that the kingdom of God is within, mm-hmm. and if, if it's within you, then you're a part of it. I'm just right. wondering, do you feel that? Um, you didn't have the same kind of energy particle or the same resonance with God that God was not a part of you in any way, shape, or form. Like, I'm just curious, curious if you can elaborate on that a little bit more. Oh, absolutely. Feelings. Well, um, there is no doubt in my mind that God created me. That's what I felt. Mm-hmm. And then I knew that God was a part of me. The way we were connected was love. And so that love was not a thing to be taken lightly. It was the strongest thing. It is the answer. And so God's love for me went completely through me, through my whole being, filled me up. Remember I said like so many times throughout this whole experience, I kept thinking I was going to literally like pop like a balloon, like burst because I I didn't have anywhere else to put the love. That's how powerful it was. So the love connected us, but yet at the same time, you know, it's like, I guess the best way to explain it is, you know, I'm a parent and so I love my children here on earth, right? I love them, but I am not them. They are their own um, individuals. So for me, that's how it was. I, I knew this was God, and I, I it was so magnificent, and I respected God, and I understood that he created me. And I also understood I was, you know, a child. I was God's child. We were connected, and love is what connected us, just like that light in the rock. That love, that light connected us. So that's... You know, that's the best way that I can explain it for what happened in, you know, my experience. Okay. We've had individuals on our program that have talked about what's called the infinite spirit, that the spirit is infinite. It can neither be created nor destroyed. It has always been. So what fascinates me about what you've just said is that you described your feeling as being created, as an external being, a celestial being, acknowledges you feel very strongly or with all your heart that it has created you. So I'm curious if the being has created you and you are created, then does that leave the realm of possibility that you yourself as a spiritual essence can actually be destroyed and be no more and that you are not eternal, that this existence that you have as a spirit, this existence that you have as a human being is one of only temporary measure? Um, Well, I can tell you this just from my experience again. There was no doubt in my mind that we are eternal beings. We are spiritual beings here having a human experience. And again, visualize that rock lesson. So the rock, when God showed me that rock, that's our vehicle. Okay, so our bodies here, the physical body, you know, tangible body that we touch, the flesh, that's the vehicle. And what is eternal is the spirit, the spirit part of us. And so, yes, the spirit is eternal, and it goes on. And here's the thing, though. Um, I mean, there's so much. You know, one of the last lessons I learned was the earth and flames, but part of that lesson was when I learned how, you know, God gives each and every one of us um, hand in hand with the gift of life, uh, free will. And that was really important for me because it goes along to answer your question about this. And, um I mean, yeah, it was just amazing because, yes, we are eternal beings, but I also, God told me that it's free will. I have a choice. I have a choice to love him back. God loves each of his children. And I say his because that's out of habit, just so you know, growing up in yeah. organized religion. But anyway, um, yeah, and so God loves each and every one of his children, not just some, but if he created you, you know, he loves you, but he can't force you. Okay, to love him back. And what I knew was, as long as I chose to have this connection, this love connection, I would be eternal. Because the eternal part that goes on is the soul, the spirit. And, you know, that's been my whole thing coming back and why, you know, getting healthy and fighting so hard to have um, medical education protocol implemented for the spiritual component to healing. We give so much attention and focus to the body, the physical, but this is only temporary. Where if the soul and spirit are eternal, like I experienced, right, 
then why aren't we giving any nourishment and healing to that magnitude? There's not even a protocol in the medical schools or the hospitals and things. I mean, I was locked in a psych ward because the doctor I told, you know, when I woke up um, about my experience, I said, you know, I have just been in heaven. I've been with God and I got put in a psych ward. So there's a lot of, um, yeah, educating that needs to happen. It's time, you know, for people to awaken. Well, you're talking to God. I wish somebody who had a near-death experience will finally ask God the question, why um, God has the worst, worst publicity team, the media relations <laughs> team ever. I mean, I, I'm, seriously, think about it. Because you got people like, you know, you got people like Pat Robertson. You got all these other yeah. crazy people like, oh, yeah, well, God's a friend of mine, by the way. I hate everyone. God Ooh. hates this person and that person. Yeah. And, you know, you don't see any kind of like, you know, issuing from the press office of God to say, listen, this is, you know, this is BS. So I'm just wondering if uh, that was one of the questions you happen to ask God. About how he's got a bad, uh, you know, bad PR. Next time I am going to take a list because that's actually an, a really great question. You know, I thought, I mean, yeah, I thought about, now remember, my experience happened 14 years ago. So it, I have had a lot of years to ponder and reflect. And boy, I tell you what, I, ha- I haven't stopped thinking about it, um, all the things that happened to me and in the lessons. And yeah, it's completely it, is, it hasn't changed my life. It has completely awakened me, you know, to the Erica, the child that I came into this planet. Um, it's given me the courage to to complete this mission. But yeah, you know, look at Jesus. I mean, my God, look what ended up happening to him. He wasn't yeah. in a popularity contest. He didn't get president or whatever. But I think, to me, it only makes sense. Um, you know, it just, it really does. God isn't going to force love or anything on any of us. But um I'm telling you, though, you know, boy, it's the most important thing. It is each and every one of us. If I could just say one thing about my whole experience, because I had so many lessons that I learned, right? Just one thing that I would want everybody to know, if I could, is it's, my gosh, each and every one of us, your uniqueness is your value. And your value, that's your contribution while you're here on your earthly journey. And so it has to start by you learning to love yourself. You know, and just the way God made you, and that's what I wasn't doing for years. But can you imagine? Because we we're led to believe as a society that not hardly any of us are valuable. You said you had some other life lessons. Can you, is it okay to quickly just discuss some of the sure. uh, most profound life lessons? Yeah, oh, no problem. Um, okay, so after the rippling effect lessons, I had um, lessons about the gifts, and so I don't know. Do you want? I'll just tell you the ones yes. I had. Um, I can tell you a little bit about it. So. Basically, God told me to look again, and um, so I'm looking and up to my right and a little bit forward, and all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, my gosh, right in front of me appeared shelves, and honestly, Ryan, there are no words, human, that I know of that give the magnitude of all these things that I experience, but I just, like, I do my best, but it's just, they were shelves, like bookshelves, and they were like this amazing white, viscous kind of color, but they were alive, and I remember looking at the shelves. And I remember looking up, and I'm looking all the way up as high as I can see, and the shelves kept on going. And then I remember looking out in front of me, past the farthest galaxy that I could see, and the shelves kept on going. And then I remember lastly looking back behind me, past heaven and the other galaxies, and the shelves kept on going. And then I'm looking in front of me thinking, oh, my God, these are huge shelves. And then as soon as I had that thought, all of these things appeared on the shelves. you know what they were? What? gifts, presents, like at Christmas, each and every gift filled the shelves. There was not space available for another gift. I mean, it was just cram-packed. And I remember studying them, and I'm looking, and I'm going, oh, my gosh. Like, none of these gifts look the same, not one at all. How is that possible? There's, like, way too many. You know, and as I'm (laughs) I'm having this feeling, because I'm, like, so overwhelmed, like, this is completely amazing. And God says to me, Erica, when each and every one of you are born, I give all of you. He didn't say some or the fortunate or I give you. He said, I give each and every one of you gifts, like at Christmas, right? And I'm sitting here looking at the gifts, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, I wonder which one I got. <laughs> and God says, when you were born, I gave you the gift of patience, and I gave you the gift of beauty. And this was the first time that I felt myself, like, arguing with God and being disrespectful or whatever of your elder. I was like, oh, no, I interrupted him. I'm like, oh, no, no, God, that can't be right. Um, I mean, I'm sure you gave me the gift of patience, but you didn't give me the gift of beauty. Because, you see, 
that was what I got bullied about, just so you know. Mm. Like, starting in middle school was my parents. And um, so here I am telling God, if that was a gift from God, then I wouldn't have gone through hell on earth, you know, paid the price for my appearance. Because I'm thinking beauty is external, right? And he, and he says to me, no, 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 Erica. When you were born, I gave you the gift of patience. And I gave you the gift of beauty. And in that moment, I knew for the first time what the gift of beauty really meant. The gift of beauty came from within my heart. See? And this external beauty, whatever you call it, that was just an extension. But the gift that really mattered of beauty came from him. And it came from within my heart. And, um, yeah, and then he went on to say that in life, he has more gifts for each and every one of us. And you know what we have to do to get them? Um, you have to put fives and twenties in the basket to go to church. <laughs> Hundreds. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> I, I don't know. I just I, that could be one of things, or you could be thankful. Oh my gosh. Um, well, he's. He <laughs> do you know you need to receive the gifts? All you have to do is ask. But then here's the thing, Ryan. After you ask, right. God said to me, and then you must be quiet and listen to be able to receive those gifts. When somebody listens to this interview, what do you want them to take away from it? What lessons do you want them to take away? If somebody who's hurting right now or has a question about death or is fearful about death, what right. can you tell that person? I can tell you that it doesn't hurt. I can tell you that we are eternal beings. I can tell you that God loves each and every one of us, and they are just as important, if not more important, by all means, than I am. They, they are so valuable, you know, just being themselves. And the most important thing we can do is learn how to, you know, um, love our unique selves and grow that connection with God, because God wants it very much for all of us. Miss Erica McKenzie, I want to thank you so much for being with us today. We can learn more about Miss Erica McKenzie by going to her website at Erica M C K E N Z I E dot com. You can check out her great book called Dying to Fit In. You can find it on the site. Erica, I want to thank you so much. We really appreciate you sharing your near death experience and all those profound lessons. I really hope our listeners appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you so much, Ryan, for having me. I, I really appreciate it and God bless. Joining us now is Mr. David Bennett, who had a near-death experience. You can learn more about him by going to his website at dharmatalks.com. That's D-H-A-R-M-A talks.com. Mr. Bennett, welcome to the program. Can you please tell us about what happened to you during your near-death experiences? Actually, your two near-death experiences. Yeah, Ryan, thank you for having me on the show. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, in 1983, I was the chief engineer of the research vessel Aloha, and, and um, we were in one of the small zodiacs, but we were in 25 to 30 foot seas, and we were capsized, and I was thrown into the ocean. And the waves pushed me down so far, and my life vest didn't bring me up, and I ended up drowning. Um, so it was quite a violent type of death but I was a commercial diver I'm used to being in the water and all of that so I found myself very curious because at first I found myself in this absolute blackness um, and some experiencers might be frightened by that but for me because I just come from this violence that um, it seemed very calming to me and I was very curious about what's going on what am I doing you know and it's it was way beyond any kind of training I had as a commercial diver where we're, we're exposed to oxygen deprivation just so that we recognize it and we don't freak out, you know. So this was so beyond that that um, um, I didn't, I, you know, I was just very curious. So you know, I wasn't frightened at all. And then I saw this light, and this light started approaching me. And as it approached me, I felt like I was in this warm embrace of just pure love. Um, it it was it was phenomenal, and I was in kind of gaga awe of the whole thing. But um, as I got closer, the light looked like millions upon millions of fragments of light, all working and moving together in uni unison, kind of like when you see uh, those flocks of birds that all fly and move at the same time and everything. It was like they had one mind, you know. And so these these just beautiful infinite fragments of light that just went on forever and three of them broke away and started coming toward me 
And as they came toward me, I recognized them as more than just fragments of light. I recognized them as being some kind of, you know, uh, entities, you know, and they were, they felt like family to me and they were emanating this, this thought, this feeling, it's not so much words, but more of an understanding of welcome home. And about a dozen of them came and greeted me. And in this greeting, we moved into the light, deeper into the light and into this area that to me felt very spiritual. And in this space is when I experienced um, what's commonly called the life review, where I not only saw my life, I got to relive it. And my, I, I call those beings, those 12 beings that breathe in me, I call them my soul family. They experienced it with me. And now I, I was kind of a, a, a brash young man back then. And uh, <laughs> I'd done some things that you might say I wasn't too proud of. So I was a little ashamed that this, you know, these, these uh, angelic beings were actually, you know, experiencing my life the same way that I was experiencing it. And so, and when I say experiencing it, it was like every person or every interaction that I had in my life, I got to see it not only from my point of view, but from everyone I'd interacted with from their point of view. I got to feel their emotion. I got to, you know, so it was incredibly intense. And and everyone I'd hurt, I got to feel their hurt. Everyone Jeez. I brought joy, I got to feel their joy. And so it was, yeah, incredibly intense and incredibly humbling at the same time. Well, can I just pause but, there for one second? When you were going through this review... Did you ever, like, you know, you have those moments that are considered the greatest moments of your life. Did you say, hey, you know, let's stop the tape. Let's, let's play that part again. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, you know especially... in the first experience, <laughs> no. In the first experience, I can emphatically say no because I was in such awe over this whole thing. And I was, I was more concerned that my soul family were going to judge me for what I was going through. Um, because, like I said, I wasn't the nicest young guy, you know. Um, I was pretty brash, and so um, I was. I was kind of ashamed, but they weren't. They weren't judging me at all. They were kind of just loving me and supporting me. In fact, it, it felt like they were actually excited to be able to just go through this with me. Um, eventually, I started seeing things. I didn't know it at the time, but it was actually I started seeing some of my future, but I didn't have reference for it in this life because I went past my drowning and then kept going and and um you know i was a little disoriented with it because i didn't have a reference for it and um but then i reached a certain point when the light itself these millions of fragments of light all spoke in unison to me and i perceive this light as god um spoke in unison to me said this is not your time you must return and i said no way (laughs) <laughs> okay, you know what? We can't. We, what you're just saying right now. I talked to a couple other people who had near-death experiences. They said the same thing. They want to stay, and then you have the free will, mm-hmm. and then you say, "No, I want to stay," and they say, "You have to go back." Well, what's the point of the free will? So I'm sorry to interrupt. So, yeah, you know what? It, yeah, that. I mean, this is something you puzzle after you come back like crazy. I mean, because you know, this is so out outside my wheelhouse. I used to be an engineer, and then suddenly I have this experience. I didn't know what to do with it. it. It definitely rocked my world. But when when God said, you know, you must return, and I said, no way, and I argued. I, I argued to stay. Um, and I thought I put up a pretty good argument. But um, but the, it, 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 it said one more thing. It said, you must return. You have a purpose. And with that word purpose, um, there's something about when you're connected to that, to that light. You're in this expansive universal mind or something that that is so much more than what we have available to us here that you can see the bigger picture and and it seems so simple and so efficient and and when they said purpose i understood that and with that understanding i accepted it and that's when i found myself outside my body and um and i had a little miraculous 
because we, again we were in really heavy seas and everything and i was actually rescued by uh, being tangled up in the wreckage of the zodiac and the waves pounding my body up against it actually pushed some some of the salt water out of my lungs and that's when i came back into my body wow and took a breath and so during your experience you said you had a vision of what, what your future was going to be like do you remember anything specific that you were going towards and when you came back, did you automatically know what your purpose was? You know, no, you don't rec- You don't remember everything. Well, you do for the first few moments, and then it's like it, it fades away. It's like it's slipping away from you, you know, and you go back into this feeling of I'm, I'm separate, I'm no longer connected, and I'm, you know, and I'm isolated. And and so you st- I st- the thing I was – screaming in my head was purpose 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 what was that purpose i wanted to try to hang on to it i could not hang on to it and um and so i had to kind of go through my life and and try to figure it out um but the funny thing is 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 it real this experience really freaked me out like i said i was an engineer and i didn't know what to do with it so i tried to put it on a shelf way back in my conscious memory and just forget about it but you can't really do it with these types of experiences. You just can't put it out of your mind because it keeps bubbling up to the surface, you know, and, and it doesn't, it just keeps percolating up there and you can't put it away. Um, so I tried to deal with what I felt I could deal with because when you're working out the sea, you don't have a lot of, back in the eighties, we didn't have the type of resources we have today. I mean, we still use ship to shore radio, you know, for telephone calls. Um, so, it was, you really, I, I didn't have access to the information that was readily available to people, you know, the shore side. So I, uh, you know, I just isolated myself I because I couldn't tell my friends, I couldn't tell my shipmates um, because I thought they'd think I'm nuts. So I isolated myself for 11 years, and that's when I had a second experience. We another day that I, experience. What happened uh, yeah. this time? Well, it wasn't so much um, IANS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies. They they call it a near-death-like experience Mm -hmm. um, because I didn't actually die this time. But what happened was I was um, in a a sacred space having a meditation, and all of a sudden I relived my experience completely from, you know, the drowning to the – the darkness into the light, the soul family, and the life review. Only this time in the life review, I'd lived 11 years since my first experience. And I got to see how just adopting a few things from that first experience had totally changed my life. And um, because what I did is I, I took the only things I could accept the first experience was acceptance of myself. You can't go through that kind of life review without understanding who the heck you are. And then tolerance for other people. I didn't know, I didn't know tolerance for other people, to tell you the truth, or life situations. I, I used to cut my swath through life. That was how I got by. That's the only way I would have tolerance for people. Is I have to have a near death experience. That's the only way to do it. Yeah, I you know, it. I, it, 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 it turned my life around. And then, and talk. then truth. There's, there's a different kind of truth that, that you see there where we have a personal truth that our heart resonates with. So those three things were what I kind of were my mantra for that 11 years until I had the second experience. And then in the second experience, I saw I really had to deal with the whole ball of wax, you know, like that was God I was talking to. That was, you know, especially when I got to see the additional 11 years and how much just working with acceptance, tolerance, and truth, how much it changed my life. Um, So I became a more, more compassionate person, you know? know, Yeah. I imagine when you're talking to God, and you go through your life, and you have to like look at all the things that you know you're not proud of, and you know you think that you're there with God. Did you ever think, think to say, "Yeah, so uh, while I'm reviewing my life, so why don't we look at you, pal, with the whole what is what a horrible things happen to good people? Why don't we look at you? Did you ever like question God and kind of call it call the being God out on some of the, the stuff that you know, human beings probably have issues with? Because I, I know there's a litany of things we could uh, Discuss that would be maybe considered God's shortcomings as to why we have to go through pain and suffering in a physical reality when we and why can't we just exit out of this dimension at will? Why can't we have this dimension? That apparently, it's an illusion. My understanding is that this is an illusion of reality, but why can't we just get out of it quicker without the pain and suffering? I think Woody Allen has a quote saying, I'm not afraid of death, I just don't want to be here there when it happens. 
So yeah, I don't want to suffer next time. Yeah. That's my. That's my. Why yeah, is, I don't want. Why does the suffer suffering have to happen? I'm just, just... I, you know what? I don't think it does. No? I, I don't really think it does. I, I think nowadays that you can have. There's so many people that have spiritually transformative experiences without dying, without all the agony and everything that goes with dying. You know. Um, and they still go through the same after effects, which is really weird. But um, I don't think you have to die to get out of your body and to connect with that divine. I think I think group, I think you know there have been mystics and 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 uh, spiritual leaders in the past that have been able to do it. You know, and they've been trying to show us the way. We just haven't been listening. And uh, because I know now, because I I do a lot of spiritual counseling for other experiencers, and I and I and I you know uh, I had a mentor that came into my life after my second experience, and she taught me that you can go back to the light whenever you want. It's just a matter. And the neat thing about for near death experiencers or people that have had spiritual experiences, they kind of have a key to the door almost, you know. It's just a matter of, of recognizing that experience and where did that manifest within you and to find the key to, to get back to that stillness, the quiet, and then you approach the door where expansiveness is available to you. But it, it, it that takes discipline. It takes – it's not something is, you is just – meditation? Do you just have to – Yeah, I, I believe in meditation. Uh-huh. I believe in contemplation meditation. Um uh, and you can do you can meditate in so many different ways. I mean, it's not just the the sitting in a Zen pretzel formation and and that sort of thing. You can you know walking meditation, okay. going in nature. I mean, there's so many ways where you can quiet the mind down enough to be able to hear. And we and because we're living in this physical life, we're only going to get glimpses. We're we're not going to see the whole ball of wax. Uh, that happens maybe after we die, but. But we're going to get glimpses, and those glimpses can can change our lives. Mr. David Bennett, I want to thank you so much for being with us today. I really thought your experience was wonderful, and uh, you know a lot of very peaceful, great insight that uh, I know people are going to appreciate. So, without David, please go to his website at Dharma Talks D H A R M A Talks dot com. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Ryan. Okay, everyone, that concludes part 10 of The Death Show. Special thanks to our terrific guest, and please stay tuned for our next episode of The Death Show, which is going to feature a highly unusual near-death experience. To learn more about the Outer Limits of Inner Truth Radio Show, please go to our website at OuterLimitsRadio.com. Want to be heard or seen in front of millions of people? Want to be an expert on TV or radio? Goldman McCormick PR is a New York City-based public relations agency that specializes in traditional and social media placement for law, finance, media, and corporate-based clients. Goldman McCormick PR also are specialists in website development, radio show creation, press conferences, media training, and so much more. Check out GoldmanMcCormick.com for more information. GoldmanMcCormick.com.